In 2009, the city of Ithaca began exploring the idea of planning for the future upgrades and repairs to the Ithaca Commons. They eventually settled on a plan and began construction on April 15, 2013. Now, close to a year and a half later, the project is reaching its original expected completion date, but it still isn't finished. And here to talk about the project and some of the challenges it's faced is project coordinator Michael Koo. Michael, thanks for taking the time to chat. Uh, thanks, Emily. Thanks for having me on. So uh, just to get us started, I mentioned that you are the project coordinator for this project, but what does that role actually entail? I'm actually the project manager for the project, and uh, the city hired me because of the, the scale and complexity of this project. They didn't feel that they could staff it internally, although they take on many public works projects, and including water and sewer upgrades and streets upgrades, and they have a lot of capable people on. It's just too much of a time commitment uh, for any one person. And also as part of their, uh, their grant application to the federal government, um, which resulted in the city getting awarded a $4.5 million grant from the Federal Transportation Administration, um, they had to, the city had to provide a project management plan and explain you know, how this thing was going to be managed. So they conceived of a few roles. Uh, one was a project manager. The second was a project engineer to observe day-to-day -day operations in the field and uh, outreach coordinator to help liaison between uh, businesses, merchants, property owners, and residents downtown since this project was going to have such a significant impact um, during construction on the densest populated uh, part of the city. Uh, they felt it was really important to, to establish this, this kind of staff. Mm -hmm. So are you just uh, in charge of essentially making sure everything is coordinated and managed day to day? Yes, the architect and engineer, the design team was already on board before I started, and they were, you know, in the process of, process of finishing up construction documents, and uh, the construction documents would be bid out publicly uh, in three phases, and I was brought on to assemble those bid packages, review the construction documents to make sure that, you know, they weren't confusing or missing information for the bidders. Uh, and the whole point of that is to try to get as solid a price as possible from your bidders. Once you get the bidders comfortable that they understand the job, they can put a more accurate number on it. And my experience in construction, you know, management, type management from the owner-developer side uh, put me in a position to be able to, to do that for the city. And then after the contracts are bid, you know, you basically sign them up to, to a uh, contract and then you have to move forward through the process of procuring materials and uh, making sure that the contractor is delivering um, the exact you know, quality that we were seeking um, in the design document. So I understand that you were uh, maybe brought on a little bit later in the planning process, but if we kind of go back to the beginning and think about this idea of re-envisioning the commons, um, can you maybe distill for us what that vision was from the beginning? Yeah, um, I was hired in February 2013, so the vision was already set. But from what I understand, it started under the Carolyn Peterson administration back in, I believe, 2007, um, when the city um, started to think about, um, you know, redesigning the, the public space here on the pedestrian mall in the Commons. And they put out an RFP, I believe, for uh, interested architects to come together and, and help guide, you know, a group of stakeholders forward and help articulate their vision for like what they saw in a future successful public space. So at the end of that process, you know, they had selected Sasaki Associates, a world-renowned landscape architecture firm, to lead the project. And they had a series of community meetings, uh, visioning plans that resulted in three different options that were presented by Sasaki to this group of uh, stakeholders. And um, at the outcome of that was that they had selected a kind of a hybrid of, of two of the options. And that called for changing the layout of State Street to allow main pedestrian flow down the center of the commons and then create amenity zones kind of framing that main boulevard and then have secondary circulation right in front of the buildings. The commons, as it used to be, had all of its circulation pretty much along the building fronts and it was center loaded with amenities. So all of those planting areas and trees and pavilions were right down the center, which really obstructed views. And it became difficult for the fire department you know, to respond to emergency calls because there's so many obstructions 
and uh, frankly, it didn't really feel like a safe place. The new layout, it should open up view sheds, give people the ability to see storefronts from lar far off. If there are events or festivals happening, um, you can see the activity down in the center and be drawn into it, and this would help stimulate business. And the Bernie Millen Pavilion would be moved to Bank Alley on the north end, and uh, you know there was basically a layout over there to allow crowds to gather. There will be a new playground as well. Um, the new lighting system is a catenary lighting system, so there are pairs of street lighting poles lining down the commons, and a wire is strung horizontally across between them, and the lighting is hung from above, so it will create like a curtain or a ceiling of light. And then there's new landscaping and some gateway arches to help um, make the entrances prominent and invite people in. Um, so thinking back to uh, April of 2013, when the um, original expected completion date for the project was set, um, I understand that date was July 31st, correct? Yes. Um, do you feel like that was kind of a realistic time frame in which to complete all this work? Well, in, in this line of work, you have to have optimism and you have to have goals. So, you know, at the time, the, me personally, I felt that the July 31st um, deadline um, wasn't really substantiated by the work, and, but we took a let's wait and see attitude. We're not going to make any changes on completion dates until we're, we're actually sure um, that the additional time is needed. But we really got into demolition and utilities work last year, and we needed every ounce of daylight up until Thanksgiving um, to get that work in the ground. We then started to learn more as we dug the commons up a little bit more about how complex and how slow the work can be. Because it's a street that's more than 100 years old and has been rebuilt several times, there's um, abandoned infrastructure that you don't know is abandoned until you ask around to all the utility companies and try to find out if someone's going to fess up to owning this thing. There's the existing utilities and then the new. So if you've got a 66-foot wide street and every utility needs its own trench, and you think that's plenty of space when you just have water, sewer, storm, telecommunications, gas, and electric. But that's, I just listed off seven utilities, and they each need four or five feet. So you've already taken up 35 out of the 66-foot width. Then you add trees to it. They're going to take up their own path. You can't pass utilities through them. And you just it just becomes a really constrained in, in three dimensions. So the work to put the utilities is going in, you know, slowly, but we're we're getting it done and we're having success. And after last year's experience, I just felt we needed the full construction season in order to uh, complete the project. So has it just been um, kind of that space constraint and working with the different utilities, both active and abandoned, that's been the biggest challenge of getting this project done? Um, I mean, what else have, have you and the project team faced um, that has been challenging in actually completing this work? Yeah, I mean, up to this point, that, that pretty much sums up, you know, the majority of the challenges out there. And then you add to it, um, we have NYSEG gas who's come in and They've got a mandate from the Public Service Commission to replace their infrastructure. Uh, you know, that's not the city's role, so the city didn't include it in its scope of work or in the contracts that we designed and let out. So, you know, we invite NYSEG to come in and replace their infrastructure because in the long term it's the best, it's in the best interest of everyone. But it doesn't come without its impacts. And as, as I tried to describe before, the coordination and doing underground work is pretty complex, and then you just add a whole new set of utilities into it, and you have to then coordinate between my construction crews and their construction crews. They're bringing trucks in to bring fresh material in and then trucks out to take spoils out. We only have three construction entrances. We have active businesses, so we have to maintain pedestrian access, and we have to make sure that, you know, we keep every building accessible to first responders. And that leads to the next constraint, which was the Simeon's truck accident on June 20th. At mm -hmm. the time, NYSEG was completing their main and looking to tie it in, hopefully, that day. But they were not able to complete their work that day. And then due to the damage to the building, they had to go find some other work to do. So they're working out of sequence. They lost a little bit of time, which means we lost a little bit of time, too. 
I also wanted to ask about the project's budget. Um, I understand that in February, uh, the city accepted a bid uh, from Vacri Construction for phase three of the project that did come in a little bit over budget, something in the neighborhood of you know $3.8 million over budget, um, which actually bumped up the total price tag of the entire project. I'm wondering what your reaction was to receiving that bid that was so high, um, and maybe uh, what you feel was maybe the cause of that being not only such a high bid, but the only bid that came in. Um, the bids came in high. You're correct. They're about three and a half million dollars over um, what, what we had available to make an award. Um, we were expecting some of that. So we've been doing independent cost estimates all the way through. You know, every time a, a bid package has been let out, we've re-estimated the job, and we were seeing some some creep in the budget number. Um, for contract three. So we had created, you know, which was pretty unusual for the city. Usually they just put a, the drawings out on the street and they take the numbers back in. Um, what we did in this case was uh, something that I learned from my past work, which was we created a list of deduct alternates, which would enable the contractor to isolate pricing for certain elements and then allow the city to execute those deducts and bring their bid down. So we were expecting about a $2 million shortfall. So that was our target with our ad alternates or deduct alternates. And because we had those in there, we were able to chip away at the number that was $3.5 million over and then basically make a request for just $2 million you know, to cover that gap. And that's what we went to council with, and council was supportive of the project. So they increased our budget to two million by $2 million. Then once we have a contractor awarded, we can then engage in a process called value engineering, which is you open up the, the documents, which have been produced by an architect and an engineer, and then you, you let the builders get into it. And you, you ask them, where are some significant opportunities for us you know, to make some savings and bring this cost down even further? So we make changes in paper material. and. We saved a million dollars there. And construction details, we simplify them a little bit. Maybe they don't get as customized and they become a little bit more um, prefabricated. So you start to pull money out of the project so that you can put it back in, into things that you want to buy. So we are able to put through this process, um, come up with a half a million dollars of savings, which we then use to commit to the playground and to bring the gateway arches back in and uh, some of the furnishings and, and plantings that we had taken out. And if we think about where the project is now um, and maybe looking towards the future, when will the project finally be completed? Um, where will things stand at the end of this construction season? When exactly is a little bit out of our hands right now, just because NYSEG is still out there trying to complete their work. And their work is underground work. They have, to, they have finished their main and they have put gas into it. And now they've been, started the process. They've probably done maybe about a third of the buildings on the commons, so running new service in and disconnecting the old one. But until they're done, we can't start um, encasing you know, the ground in concrete, which is the base layer for our finished pavers. So we're working with NYSEG, trying to coordinate with them, trying to give them, have them release at least half the site to us so we can get, we can get started. Um, on the State Street side, we're already advancing Bank Alley because they've already done their work there. They finished it in December. So in Bank Alley, we're, we're starting to form up and pour foundations for our new large blocks of stone. And in the next couple of weeks, we'll start to be pouring a concrete slab in there. And once that slab is in, after a short cure time, we're going to start putting our pavers in. So really, within the next month or so, people are going to start to see the finished product on Bank Alley and then you'll see us start that process on State Street all the way on the east side by Simeon's and Aurora Street, and then we'll just start running the field to the west. And we'll see, you know, based on when NYSE gets out of here and then our, our own progress when we regain control of those areas of the site, uh, we'll see how far we can get come wintertime. Well, I have been speaking with Michael Koo. He is the project manager uh, for the Ithaca Commons Redevelopment. Michael, thank you so much for uh, taking time out of your afternoon to talk with me. Thank you, Samuel. It's my pleasure.